like back to Iran. Apparently, Iran is six months away again. Six months away again from, um, I guess, enriching their uranium up to ninety percent, where they can build a nuclear weapon and destroy no way. all us God loving, no, no, no. God, all us no. God loving Christians in America and Israel as well. I, I, according, according to, <laughs> I don't know how long they've been six months away, but I think what twelve years or so. Yeah, you know, I don't know how many times in the last week I read that they are now enriching up to weapons grade. It must have been at least five or six times. And I almost went back on Twitter just to tweet to some of these reporters and tell them that, listen, if you don't know what the hell you're talking about, then you don't have any business writing about this and making these completely false claims. You know, what is in dispute now is that they're going over the threshold of the amount, the quantity of low enriched uranium, 3.6%. The deal under the JCPOA is they export all that excess uranium. Whatever they're not burning in their reactor right now goes out. It's formed into fuel rods by the French, I guess, or the Russians, and then re-imported and used. That way, they are allaying your pretended fears that they might use that stockpile and enrich it further up to 90% so that then they would have enough material to make a single nuclear bomb, which even then they would have to actually make it. And so even when they say, you know, breakout time, conceivable breakout time would be one year. That means one year to be able to have enough fuel to make one, not necessarily to finish actually making a bomb you know, making a warhead out of it, fitting it to a delivery vehicle, which would be what, a flatbed truck? And they're going to drive it where? Across Iraq and Jordan to Israel? <laughs> Is that it? Or I don't know. Um, but uh, yeah, no, the whole thing is a hoax. And see, here's the deal though. It's only like 99% of a hoax because the 1% of the kernel of truth in here is that Iran has a nuclear program and they have essentially a latent nuclear deterrent. I mean, they are pretty much stuck between a rock and a hard place, right? If they try to make a nuke, we're going to bomb the hell out of them before they get it done. Now, if we, we're kind of in a rock and a hard place too. If we bomb the hell out of them before they get it done, they're going to figure out how to get it done somewhere. They're going to go deep under a mountain where we just cannot get to it, and they'll make a nuke there then. And so essentially what's happening is they are proving that they know how to enrich uranium, right? They're letting us know that they have a gun in their nightstand, but the thing is it ain't loaded and they have no intention of using it. And it's essentially, it's a half measure to keep America from making matters worse is all it is. But there's no real reason to believe that they intend to produce nuclear weapons or use them against anyone. And the reality here is that Israeli doctrine says that if Iran has a nuclear program at all, we'll just call it a nuclear weapons program. We'll just consider it a nuclear weapons program. It is tantamount to a nuclear weapons program. They must not enrich at all. And so, therefore, then that it was the policy of George W. Bush and through most of Obama. And Obama in the nuclear deal finally said, all right, fine, you can enrich uranium, but just keep your program under such strict restrictions as to essentially shut the Israelis up that they can't pretend that you're six months away. Now, what's happened here? Trump left the deal. And isn't it hilarious? And there's a great uh, write up about this in fairness and accuracy in reporting that. America left the deal. Iran is in breach of the deal. Well, how is it still a deal if we already left the deal? We could never be in breach, you see. America would never violate the law by leaving a deal. No, we're just leaving a deal. We're America. We can leave whatever deal we want. I actually agree with that. Declaration of Independence guy here. We can leave a deal if we want to. But then we're going to sit there and say that they have no right to leave the deal that we left, that they are, in, they are breaching the deal, that they're in violation of the deal. Uh, when in fact, 
guess what? It turns out that the language of the restrictions on some of these quantities is actually not a major part of the deal. It's a side separate deal. And actually what it says is that the Americans must refrain from reimposing sanctions. And if they do, which lifting the sanctions was part of our side of the deal. So, and if they do, then Iran can, you know, raise the limits or ignore the limits on how much enriched uranium or heavy water or whatever else it is that they're supposed to produce. And so they're actually not in violation of the deal. That's part of the deal that the Obama administration signed. If we start breaking the deal, then there are retaliatory measures that you can take. We agreed with that. So in other words, as George W. Bush would say, huh, they shorthanded it, right? They are, they are um, you know, essentially exceeding some restrictions in the deal. And so then you just go ahead and say, oh, they're in breach. They're in violation. But meanwhile, again, they couldn't actually start making a nuke and get away with it before we bomb them. Um, certainly not with the nuclear program they have. And there's no way really for them to divert what they have into a secret program. Essentially, the only way for them to get a nuke would be if we started bombing them, then they went ahead and withdrew from the Nonproliferation Treaty ended their safeguards agreement with the IAEA and took all of their existing nuclear infrastructure deeper underground somewhere, right? In other words, taking the openly declared civilian nu nuclear infrastructure that they have and whatever's left after we bomb it and then taking that deeper underground to begin a nuclear weapons program then. So, in other words, the Hawks are the, are the greatest Iranian nuclear threat with their self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, Iran, just like almost every other country in the world, doesn't want nuclear weapons. They don't seek nuclear weapons. It's just a presumption of a bunch of Hawks that they do. And it's, it makes a great excuse for war because this is how you get the focus group to agree that, well, maybe we have to attack them then. If, as Nandalese Rice and George W. Bush said, that we don't want the smoking gun to be a mushroom cloud. In other words, we can't wait around for proof because if we wait around for proof, they might nuke Atlanta. <laughs> they might nuke your hometown and kill you in your jammies in the middle of the night. Yeah, that's what I fear every single day. Um, not really. But so I think the major problem, though, the reason why the Hawks are able to get away with this propaganda is because most people are ignorant of two things. They don't know the difference between a civilian nuclear program and a nuclear weapons program. They, are, they, heal, they hear the word nuclear and they just go bad shit crazy. We're all going to die. They think of a Skynet future um, in Terminator. Um, that's number one. Number two, they don't even know anything about the deal in the first place. Like they have no idea what the deal entails. They don't have no idea what the uranium enrichment restrictions were. They have zero clue what the deal actually is and why it was signed. So I was hoping that you could actually right. spread some light because – I think by, by far, you have done the best work on this um, as far as just putting out what the deal is, why it was a good thing from Obama. And I know you're no Obama, you're no Obama sycophant. So maybe for the Republicans who, and, and conservatives who are listening to this, um, uh, maybe you can, you can explain why, uh, we saw, what the deal is and why we got into it. Sure. Well, I mean, the deal is this, um, and it is especially right-wingers who don't know anything about it. If they know anything about it, it's totally wrong. You know, and you hear it characterized. It, it makes sense as a Republican talking point, but it's just so untrue that it's really destructive to say the Obama deal gives Iran nuclear weapons. I mean, again, that's, they're trying to make something of a substantive point. But again, that George W. Bush paraphrase is always perfect. I shorthanded it. In other words, I left out all the nuance, all the detail, and I led you to believe something that is essentially false. So they're trying to say, if they're being honest, they're saying the deal doesn't do enough to prevent Iran from getting away with bloody murder here. And that essentially that Obama just gave them a path right to a bomb. But you see how that's like a figure of speech. You know what I mean? But then they just, they just lock that down you know, and say, 
Obama signed a deal that gives Iran nuclear weapons. Well, now that's just stupid, okay? Now we're off in total fantasy land. That doesn't make any sense at all. Why the hell would he do that? According, to, according to the Republicans, it's because he's a secret Muslim. Yeah, I guess so. But again, you know, think, and this is part of being a conservative, right? Is you don't have to compare the things that you know to the other things that you know. Like Hillary Clinton was running. So if he was really a secret Muslim terrorist, you know, agent of the devil or whatever, why didn't the Democrats just nominate Hillary? You know, they preferred to anyway. The only reason they didn't was because the American people aren't all a bunch of nitwits and understood that, he, no, he's not a foreign Muslim terrorist. He's a liberal Democrat from Illinois, and that's bad enough, but they'll settle when he's up against John McCain, who's sworn on getting us into a war with Russia. So, you know, he takes your breaks where you can get them. Uh, but so look, Obama was under pressure from the Israel lobby the whole time to not do this. And at the end of the day, he said, look, the entire national security establishment, other than the worst hawks, and every sovereign government on the planet Earth, other than the Israelis, support this. And so I've heard the prime minister's point of view, and sorry, pal, I disagree. We're doing this anyway. He said it would be a betrayal of my responsibility as president of the United States if I let Israel tell me whether or not to do this deal. Now, if you live in right-wing pretend just stupid fantasy land, I guess I can't help you. But if you're willing to rub brain cells together and think the thing through at all, the reason every other sovereign government on the face of the earth supported the thing was because it was perfectly fine, okay? The real deal goes like this. Iran signed the Non-Proliferation Treaty back in 1968, They've had a safeguards agreement with the International Atomic Energy Agency all this time, back when Richard Nixon and Gerald Ford were selling them nuclear reactors and trying to build up their nuclear program. They've had a safeguards agreement ever since then. The Ayatollah, after the revolution, left the whole thing off through the entire Iran-Iraq war. They didn't even really start building up nuclear, uh, civilian nuclear infrastructure at all until the 1990s. And the only reason they went to the Pakistani black market to buy their equipment was because Bill Clinton's government kept intervening and preventing the Chinese, for example, from turning over turnkey reactors that would have been ready and would have been light water reactors that don't produce weapons grade plutonium. And yet the policy was, no, we can't even accept them having a civilian program that cannot really even be converted to a uh, nuclear weapons purpose. And so locked them out. So they went ahead and went to the black market and starting only in the Bush years, did they even begin to enrich uranium? And, you know, the Israelis, or I guess the Americans and the Israelis had found out about the Natanz facility before the Iranians had announced it. And yet it was just an empty hole in the ground. They weren't even required to announce it yet. They're not required to announce it until it's six months before they introduce nuclear fuel into the cycle at that facility. So they acted like, oh, we busted them with their secret nuclear weapons program, but actually they weren't in breach of the deal at all. And it wasn't anything but an underground, you know, giant Walmart sized warehouse, essentially, uh, deep underground at Natanz at the time that they discovered it. Well, the Bush administration then had negotiations through what they called the E3, which is our closest allies in Europe, France, Britain, and Germany and that they were negotiating on America's behalf with the Iranians. At this point, they were spinning no centrifuges, and they were perfectly willing to deal with the George W. Bush government. In fact, in their golden offer of 2003, they offered to completely suspend their entire nuclear program, and Bush turned them down and, in fact, refused to even hear it. I don't know if John Bolton and Dick Cheney even let him find out about this, but anyway. Um, and then... Uh, the Bush policy was more sanctions, more threats, and we're going to force you to give up your nuclear program. We're going to pretend to believe that you have a secret nuclear weapons program that you won't admit to, and we're going to put all these sanctions on you, and we're going to demand that you allow the um, International Atomic Energy Agency to expand their inspections and all these things. Well, the Iranians went along. 
The Iranians said, listen, as long as we're negotiating, as long as the E3 are negotiating in good faith with us, we will not only freeze all development at Natanz, we will even sign the additional protocol to the safeguards agreement that allows for expanded inspections and, um, you know, heightened accountability for questions and this kind of thing. And that lasted for years until, what, what is it, 2007, something, 2006 or seven? They finally said, forget this. Or no, it was 2005. They finally said, forget this, broke off negotiations with the E3 and started building up their nuclear facility at Natanz. Obama comes in, nothing but threats, nothing but sanctions, nothing but demands that they give up their nuclear program. Again, with the pretension that they have some secret program we don't know about that they're using to make nuclear bombs. What Obama and his government called crippling sanctions on their oil, which it's true that Trump's are even harsher, but that says nothing good about Obama's. Obama's were absolutely a stranglehold on that country. By the way, if you're against sanctions and blockades, virtual blockades like this, you're an isolationist, understand. Uh, anyway. Um, then Obama finally essentially gave in. Now, the way that the Democrats tell it was that the sanctions brought Iran to the table. But that's not true. Iran had been offering to negotiate in good faith all along. It was the Americans who wouldn't. What really happened was they expanded their nuclear program so far that they brought Obama to the table because now they had the technical ability, if they so chose, to turn out one nuclear bomb worth of enriched uranium in less than a year's time. And once they got to that point, what they call the breakout capability, which is really an unfair phrase like assault weapon kind of a thing, because again, just because you have enough uranium to make a bomb doesn't mean you can make a bomb, doesn't mean you can deliver it, doesn't mean it's necessarily even at that point a weapons threat yet. But still, that's what they call it, a one-year breakout time. And that was when the Obama government finally said, okay, We'll go ahead and we'll sign a deal that we don't need. We already have the Nonproliferation Treaty. We already have a safeguards agreement between the IAEA and the Iranians for them to verify the non-diversion of nuclear material in Iran to any military purpose. All of that was all still in effect and it was fine. It's just that it wasn't good enough. Like you said before, people don't know anything about nuclear technology. They don't know anything about nuclear treaties either, uh, whether the JCPOA or the NPT before it. And so as far as the American TV audience was concerned, there's no such thing as the NPT. No one ever said that Iran is within the NPT. Iran has the unalienable right under the Nonproliferation Treaty to peaceful nuclear technology. They're, they're not in violation. Nobody told them that. They pretended as though, and this was the Democrats, this was the Obama government said, it's either the deal or war. And they pretended as though the Iranians were trying to make nukes. And this deal was the only thing that could stop them. And they did that like for political reasons to try to get the deal passed, but they ended up conceding major lies to the war party that the Iranians really were trying to make nukes in the first place. Um, in fact, the Ayatollah said after the deal that the deal doesn't prevent us from making nukes because we weren't making nukes. We don't want to make nukes. So this deal doesn't prevent a thing that was not happening in the first place, which Rand Paul, to his everlasting shame, lied and misquoted the Ayatollah and said, oh, the Ayatollah says the deal doesn't even prevent him from getting nukes and left it at that as though that was a criticism of the deal, not a criticism of the liars who were pretending that the deal was even necessary in the first place. Are you with me? Am I making sense here? No, you're making perfect sense. And what so I find here, it here we get to the deal now. So what does the deal say? The deal says that they get, this is what America gives them. Okay. America lifts sanctions. That's it. And America gives them money that Jimmy Carter stole back in 1979. That giant pallet of money that Donald Trump is always talking about, a pallet of cash money, that was their money that America had stolen during the Iranian Revolution, had frozen. It's called freezing when government steals your money and when the U.S. government does. And 
Uh, in fact, the international court of, I forget if it's the world court or the international court of justice that rules between sovereign states and cases between sovereign states, they had already ruled that America had to give them back the money. So John Kerry, who I hate, okay, and I hate him better than you hate him or anybody in the audience hates John Kerry. Don't get me started all the reasons why, okay? I hate him, but I don't care about, ha- about being in a position of having to give him credit and say that that was actually America's end of the deal. We lift sanctions. We stop aggressing against you and blockading and punishing any country, that, any, any business that deals with you. And we'll give you your own money back that we stole. And that's our entire side of the bargain. It's that's too bad Trump bad. doesn't know that. It, it, it's too bad that Trump doesn't... It seemed like he certainly didn't understand that when he was campaigning, because I feel like a lot of the stuff that he's... What he's facing right now is due to the political promises that he made while he was, while he was running for president. Right. And a lot of those political promises were just, you just wanted another hammer to bash Obama with and get the right wing base surrounding him. Like, yeah, the, Obama, the Iran deal was just a complete forfeit of American integrity. We gave the money back. And I don't, it, it's, it's really, really aggravating when I hear people, and this is mainly from the right, saying, why did we give Iran all the, the billions of dollars back? Like, it, it's, it's a really aggravating... Well, they don't say back. They act like it came straight oh, out of your paycheck. Exactly, you're right, right. right. Yeah, they don't acknowledge this was their money that was sitting on ice for 40 years. You know? And then, so here's what Iran did, okay? Again, they already were in the IAEA uh, safeguards agreement under the NPT. They already were guaranteed to, have not, be, uh, to not be diverting nuclear material. And what they did, though, was they signed the additional protocol. All this, essentially, just to get them to sign the additional protocol to their safeguards agreement and their, um, what they call subsidiary arrangements under the uh, IAEA safeguards agreement to allow for expanded inspections. And so this is one major facet of it. So now the IAEA can inspect the centrifuge factory where there's no nuclear material, but where they make the centrifuges. They can now oversee all of the mining and every bit of ore that comes out of the mine, never mind whether it's, you know, transformed, refined into yellow cake or transformed into uranium hexafluoride gas or any of that. They now complete womb to tomb total observation of the entire fuel cycle from the time they bring the stuff out of the ground. Then they poured, um, uh, well, so that's the expanded inspections. No, I'll get, no, no, no. Let me, let me elaborate um, more on that. Trump complains, oh, we can't look at their military bases. Well, that's just not true. I mean, again, shorthanding it, leaving out all the detail. What does that mean? That means that the, the Americans or the, the IEA can't just walk right into any military base any day of the week that they feel like it. Well, can you imagine any other country on the face of the earth that would allow that? Okay, right. So now that we're back in the real world again, uh, what I mean, is that total? No, America, the IAEA can inspect military bases. And here's the deal. And, and the Iranians signed on to this, man. The Iranians went along with this, that if the Americans have any probable cause, any evidence that they can demonstrate to show why they have a suspicion Never mind probable cause or anything, but just a suspicion or a reasonable, I don't know the exact term, but any reason to believe essentially that there's something important to be found out at one of these military bases. All they have to do is convince their allies, Germany, France, and Britain. So if um, Germany, France, and Britain and the United States vote on the committee and Russia and China and Iran all vote no, it doesn't matter. It's not like the UN Security Council where if Russia votes no, it's a veto. No. The Americans win. The Americans and their Western allies have the majority on the council that decides. And so if, if does that make sense? If the Germans, the French, and the British agree with the Trump administration or the American administration's claims about why we need to look at this military base, then Russia, China, and Iran, even if they all disagree and stamp their feet, We get to go anyway. And if the Iranians forbid it, then the entire deal is off and the sanctions, the global United Nations sanctions that apply to Russia and China would have to do this too under the law. 
would all quote unquote snap back right into place. So in other words, there is a loaded gun at Iran's head. As long as they can impress the judge, their friend, the Brits, the Germans, the French, that they have enough for a warrant, they can execute it. And if the Iranians resist, the entire sanctions regime on a global scale kicks right back into effect. Now, that just makes what Donald Trump says about that issue untrue. We can't even inspect their military bases. No, that's a lie. And it's probably something that John Bolton told him, but it's something that's just not true at all. The reason that they can't inspect the military bases right now, Henry, is because they don't have any evidence whatsoever that there's anything nefarious going on at any military base. There is no reason. There's no indication to think that there is. Okay, then, so that's the inspections uh, part of the regime. Then they restricted their program. They took the entire facility at Fordo, at Com offline and reduced it to a research facility. So they're not really enriching and producing uranium there at all. The Natanz facility, they took, I think, two-thirds of their centrifuges offline, went from 30,000 centrifuges down to 10,000. And they agreed to uh, limit their amount of uranium that they hold at any given time to bare minimum amounts that they need for their electricity program at any given time, as we said. They poured concrete into the core of the Iraq reactor, that's A-R-A-K, the Iraq reactor that was a heavy water reactor that could have produced weapons-grade plutonium as waste. They just ruined it. If you pour concrete into the, into the reactor, you're done. Thing's over. It's canceled. 